Hello YouTube. I've always been very attracted to libertarianism, but I think one of the hardest parts of libertarianism to get behind is the libertarian treatment of distributive justice. Uh, most libertarians oppose wealth redistribution, and on this they uh, often go much further than even the uh, popular conservative political parties. Libertarians tend to think that wealth redistribution is in principle fundamentally morally wrong, uh, that the welfare state should be entirely eliminated and replaced with private charity. Uh, now, I mean, I'm not particularly compassionate, uh, I have a heart of stone, but even for me, this is an aspect of libertarianism that is hard to accept. So there are two questions I want to address today. First of all, why do libertarians hold such an extreme view? And second, must all libertarians reject um, wealth redistribution? Uh, might there be some way to, to justify wealth redistribution within a libertarian framework? And I should note uh, that unless otherwise specified, we, we will be assuming uh, right libertarianism, the, the kind of libertarianism associated with people like Robert Nozick, rather than uh, libertarian socialism or other forms of left libertarianism. So just as a bit of background, uh, obviously libertarians emphasise liberty as the core political principle, but libertarians tend to conceive of liberty in terms of negative liberty. Uh, so to put it simply, negative liberty involves the absence of constraints, whereas positive liberty involves a capacity to do something. Uh, for example, suppose I want to visit London. If we're thinking in terms of negative liberty, then I'm free to go to London just in case nobody's preventing me from going to London, right? It's not illegal to go to London. Nobody's holding me at my house under duress. Nobody's put a clamp on my car. So I'm free to go to London. On the other hand, Suppose I'm very poor, so I can't afford a car or other means of transport, or suppose I'm physically ill and I'm unable to go on a long trip, then even though nobody is preventing me from going to London, I don't have the ability to go to London. So I don't have the, the positive liberty to go to London. Now, of course, there's plenty of debate about how exactly to draw this distinction and whether this distinction really matters. But libertarians emphasize negative liberty. So in general, then, for, for a libertarian, you should be legally obligated not to interfere with other people, right? You're, you're not legally obligated to help other people achieve their goals. Your obligations to other people involve leaving them alone. Um, okay then, so let's sort of look at this question of wealth redistribution a bit more closely. Um, so one reason why many libertarians reject wealth redistribution is on the basis of a rather uh, simple argument against taxation. Uh, this is stated, for example, by Michael Humer in his article, Is Wealth Redistribution a Rights Violation? Uh, so wealth redistribution involves taking money from the wealthy and giving it to the poor. But prima facie, this is a violation of the property rights of the wealthy. Let's say that Frank is, we is, is wealthy and Vincent is very poor. Let's suppose also that Frank didn't steal anything from Vincent, nor did he do anything to incur a debt to Vincent. Indeed, we can just stipulate that Frank and Vincent have never even interacted with each other. If I threaten Frank with you know, violence or imprisonment or something to get him to give money to Vincent, it seems like I'm violating Frank's rights. I'm stealing money from Frank. Now, it's not immediately obvious why it would make a difference if Frank's money is instead being taken by the government. The government, after all, consists of just other people, right? Uh, each of whom should be bound by the same moral rules as any other group of people. And, and the government doesn't ask for Frank's money, it obtains it under the threat of force. So libertarians sometimes like the slogan, taxation is theft. Um, which, I don't know, it's maybe, maybe a bit silly, a bit simplistic, but I, I think it communicates the intuition behind this argument. Uh, people have, for one reason or another, freely chosen to give Frank some of their money, as a result of which he has amassed an enormous amount of wealth. To take some of Frank's money and distribute it to people in need is stealing. It's a violation of his property rights. So one response to this, which is noted by humour, is uh, what we might call the no man is an island response. The thought here is that if you have been successful in life, that will only be due to help from other people. We all depend on a community. If I have a great business that's providing me with a lot of money, well, I haven't built it entirely by myself. The success of my business is a product not just of my labour, but of the labour of others. 
So I can't really claim to have sole ownership of that business or the, the, or the profits produced by that business. So it's reasonable for the state to demand that I, you know, I, I give something back to the community. I don't hoard all of the profits uh, for myself. You know, this is just about recognizing that actually this business has been built by, by many people, by the community as a whole. And so I should give something back to that community. Now, Huma says the basic problem with this is that individuals involved in cooperative activities are compensated for their contributions at a rate that is mutually agreed by all, uh, which means that they don't really have any claim on the, um, you, you know, on the sort of profits that are generated by those cooperative activities. So, so Humor gives the example of, suppose I hire a truck driver to bring supplies to my factory. I use the supplies to create iPods that I sell for a very great profit. Now, the truck driver obviously has a, a kind of causal contribution to the production of the iPods, but surely he has no share of the ownership of them because that wasn't what we agreed upon. We agreed that he would perform a certain activity, namely delivering supplies to my factory, for which I would pay him a certain amount of money. Uh, the benefits that I later derive from having those supplies has nothing to do with him. So surely, you know, the, the truck driver has no claim to have been shortchanged, uh, assuming that the terms of our contract were clearly stated and agreed upon. He has received exactly what he was owed. So there's no case for wealth redistribution here. And, you know, the same point would apply in general to uh, all of the other ways in which m my business is a product of, you know, the labour of others. <clears throat> they have already been compensated at, at a rate that we mutually agreed, so they're not owed anything. A second response to the uh, libertarian argument is to appeal to the contribution of the state. It's not just that my success is partially due to help from other people. My success is partially due to services provided by the state. I benefit from the state providing law and order uh, because enforcing property rights is essential to economic productivity. I benefit from things like the public road system paid for by the state in which case it's perfectly legitimate for the state to demand a payment from me you know, in return for these, for these services. Okay, so, so, so this response, uh, humor, uh, says, the, the problem here is stealing my money doesn't become okay, even if you use that money to do things that ultimately benefit me. If you steal my money and use it to build a really nice bus shelter, You've violated my rights, even if I use the bus shelter frequently and I prefer it to the previous one. So just because the state uh, does things that benefit me, just because it provides services that benefit me, that doesn't make it OK for it to take my money. More importantly, though, um, this response would seem to show only that the state is entitled to demand payment for the specific services that you know, that, that benefit the wealthy. So the state can demand payment for the police, the courts, military defence, the roads and so on. But this doesn't explain why the state would be entitled to charge wealthy people for services that they don't need and don't use, don't benefit from, um, like wealth redistribution. So given all of this, uh, Humor thinks that, uh, that there is actually quite a good prima facie case, at least, that, that wealth redistribution amounts uh, to, to theft. Uh, a similar argument against wealth redistribution is given by Robert Nozick, who says that wealth redistribution is on par with forced labour. The basic idea here is quite simple. Taking the earnings of n hours of a person's labour and distributing it to somebody else is like forcing that person to perform n hours of labour for somebody else. It's forcing a person to work n hours for some other person's purpose. So taxing the wealthy and giving the money to the poor essentially amounts to forcing wealthy people to work for the poor. It's forced labor, slavery, which obviously is really very, very bad. Um, I guess we can, can, can kind of make the same point in a slightly different way. What's wrong with slavery is the, the notion that one person could own another person. In fact, people are self owners. Everybody has the right to self ownership. Uh, obviously, this, this notion of self-ownership is, is often a central, uh, central idea in libertarianism. But I think, you know, intuitively, we can all see the appeal of the, the notion of self-ownership. Each person owns himself and his labour fully. And as such, he is entitled to do whatever he wishes with his body and his labour, uh, provided, of course, that he's not uh, non-consensually interfering with anybody else, obviously. 
so self-ownership involves the right to decide uh, what happens to your person. It protects, it protects you from people doing things to you against your, well, against your will or making you do things against your will. Now, suppose we say that uh, citizens are entitled to a particular share of society's wealth. So we, we engage in some system of wealth redistribution. Then each time that you perform labour, you do so in part for the purposes of the state uh, and for the purposes of those to whom the state redistributes some product of your labour. And this entails that the state and these other members of society have a partial property right in your labour and therefore in you. They are partial owners of you. Uh, but nobody should partially own anybody else because all persons are full self-owners. Uh, G. G. A. Cohen, who uh, was actually himself a socialist, he, he, he has a nice analogy which uh, illustrates this forced labour argument. So Cohen says, suppose that whenever I scratch my back, I am required by the state to scratch someone else's. It surely follows that I lack full, self, full ownership of my hand. And the implication of non-full ownership survives when we suppose that if I scratch your back in return for scratching mine, then some further scratching of the backs of third parties can be exacted by the state from each of us after the manner of redistributive income taxation. So, I, I, you know, I mean, Cohen's point here is that if I have ownership, full ownership of my hand, which, you know, surely I do, or at least I should, then I get to decide what happens to my hand. Nobody else gets to tell me what to do with it. Um, if, if we allow the state partial control over what I do with my hand, if we allow it to you know, force me to scratch other people's backs, then the state is a partial owner of my hand. OK, um, so a couple of obvious uh, objections to this argument. Uh, first of all, you might say, well, look, nobody is being forced to work any particular job. OK, you can, you can choose what you do with your time. So it's kind of silly to say that taxation is forced labour because, you know, like I, I, I can, I can do what I want. You know, I, I, I could work in engineering, or I, or I could, you know, get a job in fast food, or I could, you know, get a, get a job in a bank, or, or whatever. Right? It's, it's up to me. Um, you know, at least assuming I can, at least assuming I'm offered the jobs. Uh, but I basically have the, have the choice of various jobs. Now this is obviously true, um, but this doesn't really address the problem because a slave who is told that he can choose from a number of options is no less a slave. Right? Just because you have a range of options about what labour you do doesn't make it any less forced labour. Uh, so a second objection is that, well, you could choose not to work at all. Um, or, or at least if your country has a tax threshold, you could choose to work so as only to meet your basic needs and only earn below what is taxed. Taxation isn't forced labour because nobody is forced to work enough that they would have to pay taxes. Um, so I think this is you know, maybe a bit more plausible than the previous response, but Nozick says that this still doesn't really address the problem. It still doesn't really address the point that the part of your labour that generates the money that is taken in taxes is not labour that you would have done voluntarily. So Nozick says, consider two people. Frank prefers working longer hours in order to gain an income sufficient to purchase luxury goods well beyond his basic needs. Vincent prefers leisure time and he doesn't care so much about material goods, so he works only enough to satisfy his basic needs. Now, we can all agree that it would be wrong for the government to seize Vincent's leisure time by forcing him to work. If the government were to say, hey, look, Vincent has a lot of leisure time, so we'll force him to work an extra five hours per week unpaid in order to generate revenue for the purposes of wealth redistribution, that would be forced labour. But then how can it be legitimate to seize some of Frank's goods for the same purpose? Nozick says, why should the man who prefers luxury goods and who has to earn money for these goods be required to provide for the needy, while the man who prefers watching a sunset and so must earn no extra money faces no such requirement? Aside from the fact that this is rather discriminatory against those who desire money, um, there, there doesn't seem to be any difference in principle here, right? If, if seizing Vincent's leisure time is forced labour, which it surely is, then seizing Frank's you know, leisure money uh, that, that he earned from his labour uh, also should count as a kind of forced labour. Um, so, I mean, that's, I, I guess, the, the sort of prima facie case uh, against wealth redistribution. Now, of course, if these arguments concerning taxation are right, 
uh, then you know that there is no room for for wealth redistribution, as that would have to be funded through taxes. Um, I don't know. I, I guess actually there would there might be other ways of redistributing wealth, but but all forms of wealth redistribution are going to involve coercively taking something from the wealthy and giving it to the poor. And all of this uh, raises the question of well, what should we say then about uh, distributive justice? However appealing these libertarian arguments might sound, surely it's obvious that there's something unjust about a society where you know some people are billionaires while some people are homeless. Uh, so you know we, we need to engage in wealth redistribution to ensure that there is a fair distribution of wealth in society. So is, is this right? Um, under what circumstances is a distribution of holdings just? Um, so first of all, Nozick um, thinks that the very concept of distributive justice is liable to be misleading because it leads us to sort of think in terms of a central distributor who allocates pre-existing shares of wealth to the citizens. Under such a system, you could legitimately complain that there's something very unfair about giving, I don't know, one person £10,000 while another person gets £10 billion. Um, but obviously that's not the way the world is. Wealth is created and then distributed by the actions of all the separate individuals in a society. Uh, so as Nozick puts it, and I quote, what each person gets, he gets from others who give it to him in exchange for something or as a gift. There is no more a distributing or distribution of shares than there is a distribution of mates in a society in which persons choose whom they shall marry. So for Nozick, the question is just under what circumstances is a person entitled to a holding. And here Nozick proposes what he calls his entitlement theory, um, which goes as follows. So, uh, first, a person who acquires a holding in accordance with the principle of justice in acquisition is entitled to that holding. And the principle of justice in acquisition tells us how it is that unowned things can come to be acquired in the first place. The world initially consists of unowned land, unowned resources. The principle of justice in acquisition tells us how people can come to acquire property rights over land and resources in the first place. Uh, second, a person who acquires a holding in accordance with the principle of justice in transfer from someone else entitled to that holding is entitled to that holding. The principle of justice in transfer tells us how property may legitimately be transferred from one person to another. So this, this is going to allow for voluntary exchanges and gifts, and it's going to rule out things like theft and fraud. It's going to define what these things are. Third, no one is entitled to a holding except by repeated applications of one and two. So in addition to the principles of justice in acquisition and justice in transfer, we also need a principle of the rectification of injustice. This would tell us how to deal with those holdings that have been unjustly acquired or unjustly transferred, uh, as, as of course many holdings in the real world have been. Um, now, the precise content of these principles isn't really so important. Uh, it would uh, you know, require a whole other video to explore exactly where the line between you know, voluntary exchange and fraud is, for instance. The important point is this, provided that everybody's holdings have been acquired in accordance with these principles, you know, however we ultimately spell out the details of these principles, but, but, but provided everybody's uh, holdings have been acquired in accordance with these principles, then nobody has any grounds for complaint about the distribution of the holdings, even if there is massive inequality in this distribution. So this is a historical theory of justice. The justice of property titles depends entirely on their history, entirely on how, you know, how they came about. A distribution of holdings is just, provided that it arose from a just situation by just steps. It doesn't matter how that distribution looks, how much inequality there is. And of course, the, the corollary of this is that whatever distributions arose from unjust steps are themselves unjust. So, you know, whether a distribution is just depends only on how it came about. And for Nozick, what really matters is that the distribution arose through voluntary actions. Uh, his slogan, playing on the Marxist slogan, is uh, from each as they choose, to each as they are chosen. So Nozick uh, contrasts his historical conception of justice with what he calls uh, patterned conceptions of justice. In patterned conceptions of justice, wealth should be distributed in accordance with some pattern. 
for example, a simple egalitarianism might say that everybody's wealth needs to be roughly equal, or at least not too unequal. The, the richest should have no more than five times as much as the poorest, for example. Or consider a meritocratic principle which says that, uh, that, that, that the distribution of holdings should track those who are most useful to society, so that those judged to be most useful should have more wealth. Or a principle which says that whoever performs the most difficult work, whoever works the longest and hardest, gets the most wealth. Um, or you know, maybe utilitarianism, which says distribute goods so as to maximise total happiness. Whatever. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of different uh, kind of patterned principles of justice, uh, uh, principles which say that wealth should be distributed according to some sort of pattern. Um, so Nozick responds to, the, to, to those who hold such views with a very famous argument, uh, the, the, the Wilt Chamberlain argument. And this argument goes as follows. Imagine a society that exhibits whatever pattern of distribution you think is just. Maybe everybody has equal wealth or the most useful people have more wealth or whatever. Call this distribution D1. Now Nozick says, Suppose that uh, Wilt Chamberlain is, uh, is a very popular basketball player, greatly in demand by, by basketball teams. Uh, incidentally, Wilt Chamberlain is a, is a real uh, basketball player, and apparently he was one of the most promiscuous men ever to live. Uh, supposedly he had sex with over 20,000 women. Now, speaking as a guy who, uh, who has a neck beard and the social skills of a houseplant, this also raises questions about distributive justice. Uh, I mean, seriously, philosophy is so much cooler than basketball. I should be the one with 20,000 groupies, but, you know, w w whatever. Anyway, um, anyway, Wilt Chamberlain uh, is a very popular basketball player, and he signs uh, the following contract with a team. Um, in each home game, 25 cents from the price of each ticket goes to him. So each time people buy a ticket, there's a separate box with Chamberlain's name on it into which they drop 25 cents. And over the season, one million people come to see Chamberlain play. So he ends up with $250,000. And we can just stipulate that this is far more wealth than anybody else in the society has. Um, so Nozick says, is Chamberlain entitled to this wealth? Okay, we, we now have a new distribution, D2, which is obviously very different from D1, and it exhibits much more inequality. Is this unjust? Well, uh, it's hard to see why it would be. If somebody is entitled to a particular resource, surely they are entitled to give that resource to somebody else if they so choose. Now, we know that in D1, everybody was entitled to their resources because we just stipulated that this is a pattern that you find acceptable. And all that's happened to move us to D2 is that people have chosen to give their money to Chamberlain in exchange for seeing him play. So under D1, nobody had any grounds for complaint, and then D2 arose due to entirely voluntary actions, due to people exchanging their resources as they saw fit. Uh, so again, nobody can have any grounds for complaint. I think there are, there are really two important points about this example. First of all, uh, it raises a dilemma for, for any patterned conception of justice. According to your view, uh, your patterned view, whatever it is, people are entitled to their holdings under D1. Now, if you claim that people are not entitled to their holdings under D2, you seem to be rescinding the claim that they were entitled to their holdings under D1. Because you know, if you're entitled to your holdings, you can choose to exchange those holdings with others so as to bring about D2. If D1 is just, then nobody has any grounds for complaint about D2 because D2 arose from their voluntary choices. On the other hand, if you accept that people are entitled to their holdings under D2, you seem to be rejecting your patterned conception of justice because D2 violates the pattern. So, so one thing Nozick is getting at here is that there's a kind of inconsistency in, in patterned conceptions of, uh, of justice. It's, uh, you, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, what, so what, what, yeah, whatever happens, either way, um, you are ultimately going to be rescinding your claim that a distribution is just only if it follows the pattern D1. Okay, second point that this example shows is that no particular pattern of distribution can be realised without continuously interfering in people's lives. 
you'd have to either constantly uh, stop people from transferring their resources or constantly take from people resources that others chose to transfer to them. So Nozick says, liberty upsets patterns. Any pattern that you might try to impose will be thwarted by the voluntary actions of individuals choosing to, to, to exchange their resources. Conversely, of course, imposed patterns destroy liberty. You can't impose a particular pattern of resource distribution while also granting people uh, liberty over their own property. Um, so you know, it should be very clear then why libertarians uh, tend to be very uncomfortable with, with wealth redistribution or with any kind of patterned uh, principle of, of justice. So we can formulate the uh, uh, Nozickian response to concerns about dis distributive justice as follows. Uh, this formulation comes from Matt Zwolinski. Um, so premise one, a distribution of holdings is unjust only if it results from the unjust actions of individuals. Uh, the distribution of holdings results from ordinary decisions about what to purchase, where to live, what projects to pursue, etc. Except in special cases such as theft and fraud, such decisions are not unjust, so the distribution of holdings is not unjust. The market is just uh, not insofar as it results in some specific distribution of wealth, but insofar as individual transactions satisfy the conditions of just acquisition and exchange. What matters is not the overall distribution of wealth, but whether each specific action is just. So provided you've acquired your money in a just manner, you're entitled to that money no matter how wealthy you are. And you, know, you can't be required to uh, distribute that money to other people, to people in need. OK, so uh, we mentioned that one element of Nozick's entitlement theory is the principle of justice in acquisition. This deals with how a person can come to acquire a property right over a part of the world that is uh, previously unowned. So how, how does a person legitimately acquire property in the first place? Uh, obviously, every libertarian will need to say something about this. And this turns out to be an area of much debate among libertarians. The traditional acquisition, uh, account of initial acquisition comes from John Locke. Locke's basic idea is that you come to acquire an unowned part of the world by mixing your labour with it. So if there's a piece of land, you come to own the land by you know, fencing off a certain area from wildlife, then cultivating the area, planting some seeds, harvesting crops. Uh, you've worked on the land and turned it into something else. Uh, so, you know, if we start from the, the idea of self-ownership, you own your body, so you own your labour, uh, you own the things that you do with your body. So by mixing your labour with an unowned object, you come to own it. Now, I mean, this is a controversial idea. Uh, there are some obvious problems with it. Uh, Robert Nozick himself raised a famous objection. Nozick, uh, Nozick asked, why isn't mixing what I own with, with what I don't own a way of losing what I own rather than a way of gaining what I don't? Uh, so if I own a can of uh, tomato juice and I throw it into the sea so that its molecules mix in with the molecules of the ocean, I don't thereby come to own an ocean, I lose a can of tomato juice. So why would mixing my labour with some part of the world allow me to come to own that part of the world? Uh, and, and I mean, not just own it, but allow me to exclude others from it. Another question is just how much labour mixing is required. If I uh, want to acquire a piece of land, is it enough to just put a fence around it? Or you know, do I have to clear away the wild plants on it? Or do I actually have to build something on it or farm it or use it in some other way to make a profit? What exactly do I have to do? Well, it seems like there aren't going to be clear answers to these questions, but despite these concerns, it does seem that in practice, if you're going to have a system of private property, then the initial acquisition of property would pr presumably take place due to something like labour mixing, you know, due to labour mixing, some sort of labour mixing, right? That's going to be how people uh, sort of turn something unowned into something owned. Um, so are there any constraints on uh, initial acquisition. Locke thought so, and his uh, account of acquisition includes uh, the Lockean proviso. This proviso states that an acquisition of natural resources is just only if, after the acquisition, there is enough and as good left in common for others. So the, the, the thought here is, if you acquire a piece of property, then you're now able to exclude me and others from using that property. So if it's a piece of land, 
Then when the land was unowned, I was free to use it. I was free to come and go as I pleased. Uh, I could walk over it, you know, I could pick up stuff that I found on it, etc. But now that you own it, you can exclude me, which makes me less free than I was before. Isn't that unfair? Uh, the point of the Lockean proviso is that I don't really have any grounds for complaint if after your acquisition of the land, there is still enough land for me. Um, now, there's a lot of debate about how exactly we should interpret the Lockean proviso, but Nozick's interpretation is as follows. Nozick says, a process normally giving rise to a permanent bequeathable property right in a previously unowned thing will not do so if the position of others no longer at liberty to use the thing is thereby worsened. So the Nozickian uh, interpretation of the Lockean proviso requires that nobody be made worse off by the acquisition than they would be uh, if the thing had remained in common use. Appropriation of resources must not worsen the situation of others. And if it does, of course, then those others are owed compensation. Now, of course, given that land and natural resources are finite, you might say, well, surely any act of acquisition would leave people worse off. Uh, if you acquire a property right over a resource, then others will no longer be able to use that resource as they see fit. Uh, and that, that, you know, there will be less for them because, because the resources are finite. Uh, so, so doesn't that make them worse off? Um, you know, other people might have to travel further to find more of that resource or whatever. That surely makes them worse off. Um, but Nozick says, no, that's not so, because private property and private enterprise have enormous social benefits. If, if I start farming the land, the land will produce much more food than it would in a wild state. I can then sell this food to others. In general, if there's some unowned natural resource, then either nobody's using that resource, in which case it's of no benefit to anybody, or people are using it. But then that's likely to lead to a tragedy of the commons situation. Um, you know, it may be overused. Uh, so, you know, so, so, so the thought is actually that there are very great social benefits of private property. And, you know, uh, I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it produces a lot of uh, a lot of wealth and a lot of resources for others. So in general, people are not made worse off. But an important thing to note um, about uh, the, the proviso is that it does follow that a libertarian system with robust private property rights is justified only insofar as it makes people better off than they would have been under a you know system where things were were unowned or in common ownership um, you know so if free markets and private property led to the impoverishment of large groups of people at least relative to where those people would have been were resources unowned then on Nozick's own view uh, that, that that system would not be morally justified. Now, Nozick thinks that this is in fact the case. He thinks that it's likely that for almost everyone, even those in relative poverty, the benefits generated by private property ownership outweigh the, the harm of being unable to appropriate unowned goods. Uh, so yeah, even people who are homeless are better off than they would be uh, were they in a, a state of nature, as it were. Uh, but obviously that's uh, a point that is open to question. There's also uh, much debate about whether the Lockean proviso is strong enough. Uh, and this opens up more egalitarian ways of uh, formulating libertarianism. Many left libertarians endorse an egalitarian proviso, uh, which starts from the assumption that in a state of nature, resources are not unowned, but rather in some sense commonly owned. So everybody has an equal share in natural resources. One way to frame this proviso uh, is to say that if you take more than your equal share, you must provide compensation to everybody else. Another option is to say that every time you appropriate a natural resource, you must provide compensation to the community equal to the value of the natural resource in its unimproved state. So you have full property rights over the additional value produced through mixing your labor with the natural resource, but the value of the natural resource in its unaltered state is common to all, and therefore they are owed compensation when you appropriate it. This might take the form of something like a land value tax, for example. And there's an obvious intuitive appeal to these left libertarian provisos. Why should somebody be entitled to all the benefits derived from some natural resources merely because they were the first to use them? When we consider an unowned resource and ask how to distribute it, equal division surely seems like the fairest approach. Um, 
Now, obviously, we do need to allow people to appropriate resources for themselves. The system of private property does seem to bring uh, enormous benefits. But with a stronger proviso on initial acquisition, the community can demand compensation. Other people have a claim to a share of the value of natural resources in their unimproved state. Mixing your labour with natural resources only entitles you to the added value that your labour produces, not the whole value. So you know, once, somebody, once somebody appropriates resources, they have to pay compensation. So the point here is that actually we can accept Nozick's entitlement theory, but still insist on wealth redistribution by adopting a more uh, restrictive principle of justice in acquisition than is given by the Lockean proviso. I mean, there, there may still, under these, under these left libertarian systems, there may still, in fact, be substantial inequality. Uh, it's just that, you know, so, so there may be substantial inequality because after you've uh, acquired a, a natural resource and you, you know, mix your labour with it, uh, that might produce great benefits for you. Um, but these kind of build in a requirement for some some form of wealth redistribution because in fact you, you don't have the right to just kind of f to have sort of full ownership of of natural resources so um one aspect of nozick's entitlement theory that we haven't discussed yet and uh this is the principle of rectification of injustice nozick's entitlement theory tells us that a distribution of holdings is just provided that the holdings were acquired justly and transferred justly. But what if they weren't? It's pretty clear that in the real world, the distribution of wealth has uh, not resulted from just acquisition and transfer as defined by Nozick. There have been all kinds of injustices through history. Land and resources have been stolen, communities have been killed or displaced, people have been defrauded. Now, on a historical theory of justice like Nozick's, any injustice at a particular time will undermine every subsequent distribution for as long as that injustice goes unrectified. The third condition of Nozick's entitlement theory says that if your holding was not acquired in accordance with the principles of justice in acquisition and justice in transfer, you're not entitled to that holding. So we need to say something about how to rectify past injustice. Nozick's own suggestion is that we need to determine what the distribution of holdings would be had the past injustices not taken place. So it's just based on, you know, the sort of counterfactual judgment, right? What, what would the world look like had these injustices in the past not occurred? Obviously, some rather obvious, you know, some big problems arise at this point. Um, even in simple cases where we can identify a specific victim of injustice, there may not be any fact of the matter about what would have occurred had the injustice not taken place. Suppose I steal your watch and it gets passed to my son and then my grandson and then, you know, then his son, you know, my great grandson. And at this point, we're both dead. Now, obviously, the watch should be returned to your family, but who in your family? Which of your great grandchildren should get the watch? Obviously, this kind of question becomes even more difficult when we think about entire communities being displaced, as happened with, uh, you know, the Native Americans and with slavery and things like that. In these cases, many people have ancestors from both the oppressor and the oppressed groups. So it's kind of hard to identify a specific class of modern victims. A second problem with rectifying past injustice is that the number of injustices in history is enormous and many of them are just unknown. Injustice extends back to before civilization. Let's say we manage to rectify the injustice of the displacements of Native Americans. Well, the ancestors of the displaced Native Americans themselves committed injustices against earlier peoples. So actually the displaced Native Americans weren't entitled to their holdings either. Uh, and obviously these earlier peoples committed injustices against still earlier peoples and so on. Now Nozick was aware that his theory can't really be used to determine the justice of the present distribution of wealth. Uh, with respect to mass injustice, Nozick himself seemed to favour something like reparations. We can, in a rough and ready way, identify classes of people who are better off than where they would otherwise be due to historical injustices and classes of people who are likely to be worse off than where they would be uh, due to uh, uh, historical injustices. Um, and we can require that payments be made from the former to the latter. Obviously, that's, you know, it's really not very satisfactory at all, but that's basically the best we can do. Interestingly, though, many libertarians are sometimes pushed to favour quite radical uh, 
wealth redistribution on the basis of rectification. Lysander Spooner, who was an, an early American individualist anarchist, uh, he advocated violent revolution of the Irish peasantry against their landlords on precisely this basis. The Irish lands were taken by the British by violence, and this injustice uh, tarnishes all subsequent distribution of the lands. Uh, so as Spooner said, and I quote, Neither the original robbers nor any subsequent holders have, uh, have ever had any other than a robber's title to them, and robbery gives no better title to lands than it does to any other property. No lapse of time can cure this defect in the original title. Every successive holder not only endorses all the robberies of his uh, predecessors, but he commits a new one himself by withholding the lands either from the original and true owners or from those who, but for the robberies, would have been their legitimate heirs and assigns. Um, so, yeah, so for as much as libertarians are in theory against wealth redistribution, the rectification of historical injustice provides grounds for really quite substantial wealth redistribution. Um, obviously, though, this is a one-time thing. Uh, uh, once the injustice has been rectified, the free market and voluntary exchange takes over and we have to allow the chips to fall where they may. Uh, so very substantial inequality might rise again. Um, Rectification isn't going to provide much comfort to those who are concerned about distributive justice in the in the long term. Uh, but it, I just think it's worth noting that actually that there is a very strong libertarian case for uh, substantial wealth redistribution on the basis of rectifying injustice. Um, OK, so uh, I'd now like to suggest a couple of other ways in which uh, a, a sort of Nozickian libertarianism might uh, accommodate at least a minimal concern for distributive justice. Most libertarians accept the minimal state, uh, where the minimal state uh, is a state that provides just uh, what is required in order to enforce the law uh, and in order to protect people from breaches of their rights. So the minimal state provides police, courts, military defence. Nozick himself defended the minimal state. But this raises a question. If the state is taxing people anyway in order to fund the activities of the minimal state, why not also tax people for wealth redistribution? Um, I mean, remember, the, the arguments that we saw against taxation, right? the, the, the argument that taxation is theft, that taxation is on par with forced labour, and Nozick's entitlement theory, well, these clearly uh, apply to taxation in general, not just taxation for the purposes of wealth redistribution. So once you've granted that taxation is acceptable in principle, it's hard to see how you can resist uh, you know, using taxation for other things, for things like lifting people out of poverty. Michael Humer, in his article, Is Wealth Redistribution a Rights Violation, puts the argument this way. Premise one, if taxation to fund wealth redistribution is a rights violation, then taxation to fund the minimal state is a rights violation. But, premise two, taxation to fund the minimal state is not a rights violation, so taxation to fund wealth redistribution is not a rights violation. So how might the libertarian respond to this? I mean, can, can the libertarian reject premise one? Uh, I think the, the big difficulty with rejecting premise one is that what the state does to you to extract taxes is the same no matter what those taxes were used for. So whether your money goes to fund the police or to fund a social welfare programme, either way, the state is coercively taking your money. Uh, and in fact, it's these days it's just indeterminate where exactly your money goes so consider a, a random 10 pound that is extracted by the state where does that 10 pound go well because money monetary transactions are so often electronic we won't we, we often won't be able to track a specific 10 pound if money were all, all were all like physical you know if we all had you know if it were just all notes and coins then we would be able to track each bit of money each 10 pound note and we'd be able to specify exactly where it ends up but these days, there's no determinate answer to, you know, where, wh to whether your taxes will be used to fund minimal state activities or whether they'll be used to fund other things. Um, so that's, I think, you know, it's going to make it kind of difficult to reject premise one uh, because, you know, the, the, what the state is doing to you, the action the state is taking is the same, whether it's for funding wealth redistribution or for funding minimal state activities. Um, OK, so what about rejecting premise two? Well, this is Humer's preferred response. He thinks that libertarians should say that taxation is always a rights violation. Right? It's a coercive transfer of property that belongs to the taxpayer, even when it's used to fund the minimal state. Now, of course, this raises the problem of, all right, well, what do we say about the minimal state? 
And here there are three options. First of all, we might just reject the minimal state and become anarchists. Uh, we might, you know, become this is anarcho-capitalism or or free market anarchism, and this is Michael Humer's own view, incidentally. Um, I think I think he's a market. He's, a, he's an anarcho-capitalist. Uh, so yeah, so some libertarians just go all the way, all the way to anarchism. Uh, second, perhaps there are voluntary methods of funding the minimal state, like user fees and donations. Uh, there might be enough people who consider the, the minimal state a worthwhile cause that it could be funded purely voluntarily. The final option is to say that taxation is a rights violation, but it's a justified rights violation because the consequences of the state collapsing would be so bad. Sometimes it's okay to violate rights to prevent a much worse outcome. Let's say that Frank is about to detonate a bomb that would kill millions of people. Vincent owns a rare gun that he doesn't want anybody to touch, but I grab Vincent's gun to kill Frank. This is a violation of Vincent's property rights, but surely it's justified. I mean, surely you couldn't blame me for grabbing Vincent's gun here. Um, rights are constraints on how you can act so as to, you know, so as to achieve other goals, so as to maximize utility or whatever, but they're not absolute constraints, right? The risk of catastrophic consequences might override your rights. So I can't, you know, I can't take Vincent's gun um, in order to, I don't know, turn it into a nice art exhibition that would produce lots of pleasure for millions of people. Uh, I, can't, I can't do that. Um, but taking Vincent's gun in order to prevent Frank from detonating a bomb and killing millions of people, that seems fine. Surely that's okay. So surely we, there are circumstances where we can violate rights in order to prevent very bad outcomes. So, um, so th th there are three options then for the libertarian who rejects premise two. Now, the point is, relatively few libertarians are going to accept the first two options. Most libertarians will accept that, yeah, we, we do need a minimal state and we're probably going to have to tax people to fund it. So that leaves us with the third option. But the trouble here is that if you accept the third option, it's very hard to see how you could have a blanket ban on wealth redistribution. The third option says that we can violate people's property rights if the consequences of not doing so would be bad enough. Right, a minor violation of property rights to fund the minimal state is acceptable because not having a minimal state would be, would be so bad, it would be catastrophic. But then the supporter of wealth redistribution will say, look, people starving to death or people dying of easily treatable diseases because they can't afford healthcare or parents unable to afford basic education for their children. These are awful outcomes. The minor rights violation uh, of a you know, reasonable level of taxation is worth it to avoid these horrors. So, uh, so that you know, the same kind of reasoning that supports the minimal state also supports certain basic welfare programs. So there's one possible route from libertarianism to uh, wealth redistribution. Here's uh, another, um, which I think is perhaps more, um, you know, I, I guess the, 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 the that previous route to. to wealth redistribution involved a, a sort of compromise of libertarianism. But here's a route to wealth redistribution that uh, I'm, I'm not sure it, it does involve a compromise of libertarian principles. So um, again, let's take the, the libertarian like Nozick who accepts the minimal state. And the question is, what exactly is the minimal state? Well, by definition, the minimal state is a state whose only role is to enforce your rights. Uh, as conceived by libertarians. It ensures that people do not interfere with you or your property without your consent. And it sees that you are properly compensated and that rights violations are properly punished. Now, um, as, we, uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, libertarians conceive of liberty in terms of negative rights or non-interference. You have liberty uh, basically as long as people leave you alone and allow you to make your own decisions about what to do with your body and your property. But there are circumstances where we can't reasonably expect people to leave you alone. If I'm literally starving to death and you have a massive buffet of food that you're not using, then it's okay for me to steal your food. Now, for a libertarian, there's no question that if I steal your food, I'm violating your property rights. But surely I can't be blamed for this. And surely I shouldn't be punished for this. It would be absurd to demand that I respect everybody's property rights if it's a matter of life and death. You know, if my very life depends on me not respecting their property rights. I can be expected to respect other people's liberty and not interfere with their property only if I myself have sufficient resources.
So I mean, this is perhaps a problem for for standard libertarianism. Standard libertarianism demands uh, the, you know, this sort of strong enforcement, strong respect of property rights. It demands that all citizens respect the property rights of other citizens. Yet it seems it's perfectly happy to allow an indeterminate number of citizens to fall into a position where they they really can't be morally required to respect property rights. Uh, Lauren Lemaski, in his article Justice to Charity, uh, states the problem nicely. He says. There is no assurance that liberty will universally guarantee to all persons the requisites for living as project pursuers. For one situated at the margin of exigency, adherence to an order of mutual non-interference can be extremely costly. Reciprocity demands that individuals precariously perched on the edge of exigency can be obligated to respect the liberties of others only if they are simultaneously ensured a sufficiency of material goods. Um, so you know, so, so yeah, the thought is well, you know, ad adhering to this uh, to, to this system of non-interference, of leaving other people alone, basically. If you if you are living in poverty, or you know, if, if you're in a situation where you just don't have food, that's extremely costly. You know, it's going to potentially cost you your very life, uh, and it's just not reasonable to expect somebody to to incur a cost like that. So. The suggestion then is, well, we might actually view a basic social safety net as being part of the duties of a minimal state. By definition, the minimal state provides just enough to properly enforce rights, including property rights. It does just enough to make sure that nobody interferes with you or your property without your consent. But the minimal state can't properly enforce property rights if there are loads of people in desperate need, because such people shouldn't be blamed and shouldn't be punished for stealing. So if you, know, if, if you really care about property rights, as libertarians say they do, then you should favour wealth redistribution so as to ensure that no citizens are in a position where it's morally permissible for them to violate property rights. Funding a social safety net involves a minor controlled violation of property rights in the form of taxation, but it ensures that uncontrolled violation is not morally permissible. So it's, you know, similarly funding the police force involves a minor controlled violation of property rights in the form of taxation to ensure that uncontrolled violation of property rights does not occur and is punished when it does. I mean, we can imagine a libertarian utopia where nobody ever coercively interferes with anybody else and all, all interactions are purely voluntary. But of course, that's you know, it's, it's a utopia, right? We could never build such a society. In the real world, there will always be crime. There'll always be the, the threat of war. Your liberty will be threatened by other people. Most libertarians think we need a minimal state in order to properly protect your liberty. And any libertarian who accepts that kind of reasoning needs to ask, what exactly does the minimal state need to provide in order to do this, in order to properly protect people's liberties? Well, for one thing, it needs courts to punish rights violators, but a court can't punish a thief who has the mitigating circumstance that he was starving and couldn't afford food or was dying of a disease and couldn't afford treatment. Uh, so part of the duty of a minimal state, part of the definition of a minimal state uh, is to ensure that nobody ends up in such a position. So maybe that's that's one thing. Uh, so maybe that's one way of, of kind of arguing from libertarianism to a limited degree of wealth redistribution. Okay, so so sort of s summing all of this up then. Well, first of all, I hope to have shown why it is that many libertarians reject wealth redistribution. But second, I hope it's also clear that this isn't a necessary feature of libertarianism. Um, and in fact, it's not even a necessary feature of right-wing Nozickian libertarianism. Uh, coercive wealth redistribution might follow from libertarian principles in, in three ways. First, through stronger provisos on the initial acquisition of unowned resources. Second, through the rectification of historical injustice. And third, through uh, reconceiving the role of the minimal state. Um, now, that's not intended to be exhaustive, of course. There may be other ways of building wealth redistribution into libertarianism. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to give you a flavour of the ideological diversity that is possible within libertarianism on this particular issue. Um, okay then, so that's all. Thanks for watching.